Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou I inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only are first in my heart. I keep. If you have your personal copy of God's Word, please turn with me, if you will, to the book of Judges. The chapter is 21, and the verse is 25. Judges, the chapter is 21, and the verse is 25. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, there you will find these words. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Continuing on with our series on the survey of the Bible, we're talking about the book of Judges on tonight, and so we're going to talk about Judges Overview. The overview of Judges. As always, we're going to talk about the facts about the book, followed by understanding the book, and then conclude with an outline of the book to help facilitate our study of the scriptures as we read through the Bible. First, let's talk about the facts of Judges. The author of Judges is believed to be Samuel. There is no book, chapter, or verse to prove that. It is just simply by Jewish tradition. And who was Samuel? Samuel was the very last man to serve as a judge of Israel. As a matter of fact, when we used to have the young people's class at the beginning of evening services, we would say that, the judge, that there were 15 judges. There are 13 judges spoken of in the book of Judges. It's in 1 Samuel that we learn about the last two which would have been Eli followed by Samuel. Now, the book of Judges gets its name because of the people that ruled Israel at that time, as well as how Israel was ruled during that time. They were ruled by judges. This is why it is called the period of Judges. This is the period from the time Joshua dies all the way to the point where King Saul or Saul of Kish, a Benjaminite, is crowned king of Israel. But what is a judge? Well, a judge is a leader who delivers justice. Now, the Hebrew word for the book of Judges is Sefer Shoftim. It speaks to the period of leadership God's people were under and the heroes that God used to bring them deliverance when they were in the midst of servitude. Now, the book of Judges does have a nickname, and that nickname is that it is called the book of Israel's failures. One of the things we see in the book of Judges is Israel failing to do what God has commanded them to do time and time and time again. The book of Judges points to Jesus Christ just like the previous six books did. And this book points to Jesus Christ as being our deliverer 
judge. You had many types of judges during this time. You had prophet judges. You had warrior judges. You had priestly judges. But Jesus serves as our deliverer judge because when we look at the Christ that we serve, the one that died for us, not only is he a judge of humanity, he is also a deliverer of the sinner from iniquity. So Jesus is not just judge, he's not just deliverer, we see him as being a deliverer judge. Listen to your Bible as we hear Jesus' own words in John chapter 12, verse 44 through 50. In John chapter 12, beginning with verse 44, the Bible reads, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words, Jesus says, and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority. But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. One of the things we learn from the book of John, particularly in John chapter 3, that Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world, I came to save the world. But in saving the world, he did his work, and then he gave instructions by which we must be saved. If we do not follow those words that Jesus gave, he says in this text that it is those very words that are going to be the words to judge us in that final day. But if we accept what Jesus has done for us, and not only accept it, but live by his words, then to you, Jesus is a deliverer judge. And this is what the book of Judges points or, or identifies for us, the Messiah, this Jesus. So these are just facts about the book of Judges. Let's talk about understanding Judges now. The book of Judges covers the first 300 and 50 years of Israel's settlement in the promised land. Joshua has died. They have crossed the Jordan. They have conquered many enemies. They didn't conquer everybody, and God had a reason for allowing certain nations to stick around so that his people would learn to be dependent upon him to overcome what these other nations were going to bring. But what we see are the failings of these individuals in keeping the law that God gave them in Exodus and Deuteronomy the first 300 years since they have taken possession of this land. Now, during this time, we recognize that leadership was lacking, which worked to the disadvantage of the people. This is clearly seen in the apostasy of Israel and even in the refrain of our scriptural text. We read the last verse in the book of Judges that there was no king in Israel and the people did what seemed right in their own eyes. And we later go to the book of Proverbs and we read in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 as well as Proverbs chapter 16 verse 25 that teaches there is a way that seems right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. We see this being played out in the book of Judges. But when we see that phrase in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, that's not the first time we see that phrase because the book of Judges records it in Judges chapter 17, verse 6. That's the first time we see it. And then it begins chapter 18 with that same saying. 
and it begins chapter 19 with that same saying, and it ends the entire book as the summary of what took place these past 350 years. What we see during this time is that God's people worshiped other gods. But what they did uniquely in this is that they worshiped these other gods alongside the God of heaven. So what it was is that they added idolatry to the worship of God. And whenever you add something to the worship of God, then you cease to worship God. But this is something that they did that made them feel good in their conscience. And this is what a lot of people do today in the 21st century. I walked in a church of Christ, so it doesn't matter what they do in the building. For as long as it says church of Christ, my conscience is clean that I went to worship, that I'm at the right place, even though they may not be saying or practicing the right things in the place that carries a scriptural name. Well, that's not something that we just started doing. This is something that was being done in the book of Judges. For as long as I show up on Saturday, I can do what I want on Sunday. This was the psyche of the people after the death of Joshua and those elders that led Israel after the death of Joshua. When we read the book of Judges, we see words such as unfaithful disobedient, rebellious, and stubborn would best describe Israel during this period. Israel's departure from the faith was so bad during this period that even though they had more years of faithfulness than disobedience, we tend to only remember their transgression and tribulation. There have been many sermons that have been preached about the book of Judges and something that people constantly say when they come to these 21 chapters is that this was the saddest period in the history of Israel. Well, it wasn't because they were all bad for 350 years. It's just that when they were bad, they were really bad. And so they were confused religiously as we see in judges chapter 17 and 18 they were confused morally as we see in judges 19 and 20 they were even confused politically as we see in judges chapter 21 one of the things when we we are able to see when we study the book of judges is that we as christians we are programmed hermeneutically to try to look for patterns and the book of Judges is nothing but pattern after pattern after pattern that after you catch the pattern after the second pattern, you already know what's going to happen before you read the next chapter because it's following the same pattern. The pattern is described for us in Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. So we don't have to go to a commentary. We don't have to hear a theologian. The Holy Spirit gives us the pattern in Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. The Bible reads, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm as the Lord had worn and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges 
who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them, yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved with pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods serving them and bowing down to them they did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways that is the cycle of God's people in the book of Judges God's people will abandon the Lord so the Lord will lift up his hedge of protection and allow an enemy to come and oppress them and in their oppression, they will cry out to the Lord and the Lord will hear their cry. The Lord responded to their supplication by sending a person known as a judge. Now, a judge was a political or military leader who brought justice for the people of Israel by defeating their foreign oppressors. And for as long as that judge was alive, the people were faithful. But as soon as that judge died, the Bible says they became worse than their fathers after the death of that judge. And so when we look at the book of Judges, we see the pattern of abandoning God, God causing them to be conquered. They can't bear the conquering anymore. So they cry out to God and God sends a judge and the judge delivers them and then they start being faithful to God. But as soon as that judge dies, they go back to old habits and the cycle re continues over and over and over again. And in the book of Judges, we read about seven such apostasies. We see that the book of Judges neatly fits within seven failures, which led to seven servitudes which led to seven deliverances that were all carried out by 13 judges. Let's talk about the first oppression. The first oppression is found in Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. We see that their sin was idolatry. So what was the punishment? The punishment was eight years being conquered by the king of Mesopotamia. And then God sent the deliverer. And the deliverer's name was a judge, Oth uh, Othniel. And then after Othniel died, they started acting crazy again. That leads us to the second oppression, which we read about in Judges chapter 3, verses 12 through 31. Their sin was not just idolatry, but they began to, began to uh, act, uh, began to give themselves to immorality as well. And what was their punishment? 18 years of servitude. And we see that there was four kingdoms that came together to conquer God's people, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Amalekites, and the Philistines. And so God sent not just one deliverer, but he sends two. He sends Ehud as well as Shamgar. And after these men died, they began to go into greater apostasy, which brought about the third oppression which we read about in Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5. Their sin was that they departed from God. And so what was their punishment? 20 years of servitude under the Canaanites. And God sent two judges, a prophetess by the name of Deborah, or for the sake of the sister that worships here, Deborah. We're going to call her Deborah. Thank you, Sister Deborah. All right, so Deborah and Barak. And so after Deborah and Barak died, the people turned back to sin again. And that brought about the fourth oppression, which we read about in Judges chapter 6, all the way to Judges chapter 8, verse 32. Their sin was that they departed from God. Their punishment was seven years of servitude under the Amalekites as well as, as, well as the Midianites. And their deliverer 
was a great judge by the name of Gideon. Now, after Gideon dies, his son killed all his brothers and tried to take the mantle of king for himself, thus bringing about the fifth oppression, which was a departure from God again. And the punishment was a three-year civil war among the tribes because Gideon's son, Abimelech, usurped authority and tried to become king. As a matter of fact, he called himself king, but yet God never recognized him as king. And so God sent two deliverers to deal with Abimelech, even though these judges delivered the people out of servitude, but it was a woman who actually killed Abimelech. And we read about the deliverers being Tola and Jer. But then after Tola and Jer died, there came a sixth oppression, which we read about in Judges chapter 10, uh, all the way to Judges chapter 12, verse 15. Their sin was that their idolatry increased. When their idolatry increased, they were punished for 18 years by the Ammonites. And as a result of their uh, servitude to the Ammonites, God sent the deliverer by the name of Jephthah, who delivered them from the Ammonites' rule. And then after Jephthah, God sent three more judges. That was Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. And after these four men died, the people of God went back into apostasy, bringing about the sixth or the seventh and final apostasy that we read about in Judges chapter 13 all the way to Judges chapter 16. Their sin, again, was that they departed from God. Their punishment was their longest period of servitude which was 40 years in which they were being ruled by the Philistines. And so God sent the deliverer by the name of Samson to bring them out of this rule. Now, the hint of the Messiah in the book of Judges is this. That is, when we fail, Christ will judge and discipline. But when we call out to the Lord, he will hear our cry, and he will deliver us from the sins that had us bound. There is not one verse that we could point to and say that this is messianic, very similar to the book of Joshua. All you have to do is look at the life of Joshua, and you see in Joshua Jesus, and all that Joshua did for Israel is even more on a greater scale what Jesus does for his people Today, But in the book of Judges, we see these judges playing the role of our Savior as a result of our sin and as a result of our transgression. And just like these individuals were delivered time and time and time and time again, it's the same thing Jesus does for us. Whenever we repent, what does Jesus do? He delivers and he forgives time and time and time again. You know, I tell people all the time, God is not a God of a second chance because just like Israel, maybe we used our second chance a long time ago. We serve a God of another chance so that he gives us another chance as we see in the book of Judges. He keeps giving Israel chance after chance after chance after chance to make things right with him. So that now brings us to the outline of the book of Judges. It's just a simple three-point outline. We see Israel's failures in, first, in, John, in Judges chapter 1 all the way to Judges chapter 3 verse 4. The author makes no apology of exposing everything that Israel was doing wrong during this period of time. But then we begin to read the narratives in Judges chapter 3, verse 5, all the way to Judges chapter 16, verse 31, in which we learn about the judges, and these judges are identified, and we read about their deliverance and their exploits. But one of the things that the book of Judges also shares with us are the failings of 
these judges. And then when we read in Judges chapter 17 to Judges chapter 21, all we have there is really an appendix in which we are given some more side notes as to some other things that was happening within the tribes and how they dealt with those issues that brings us into the book of 1 Samuel and almost why the people at that moment started to cry out for a king. Because we see throughout the book of Judges that Israel's sin was that they kept trying to be like the nations that were around them. And so in conclusion, there's three things that we learned from the book of Judges. Number one, that the God that we serve God is patient, God is just, and God is merciful. He will take his time with us however long it takes for us to get right. Whatever he does is going to be the right decision because God is fair and God is merciful, meaning that he doesn't give us what we do deserve. Again, Israel should have died in that land. But God would not allow it. He kept giving them chance after chance by sending deliverer after deliverer because God is going to receive his glory. But aren't you glad that today we serve the same God who is patient with us, who is just in dealing with us, and who is merciful towards us? We also see in the book of Judges that God can accomplish his plan even through flawed individuals. None of these judges were perfect. Even the last judge who God used to bring them out of their greatest servitude, a man by the name of Samson, in which he had one rule. God said, don't cut your hair. I'll be with you for as long as you don't cut your hair. But because he just had to have the ladies is the reason why he lost his hair, lost his strength, lost his eyes and ended up a slave to the Philistines, Jephthah, and his rash and tragic vow that he made that led to the death of his own daughter, Gibeon, Gideon rather, who argues with God and tries to put God to the test. All right, God, if you're really calling me, do this. Uh, anybody can do that. All right, God, if you're really calling me, do that. All right, God, anybody can do that too. If you're really God, do this and that, and then I'll believe in you. And it's like, wait a minute, he's already called you a mighty man of valor. Why are you questioning God's statements and resolve regarding you? These were flawed individuals, and yet God used them to bring about great deliverance of his people. We also see, that God holds his people accountable to his expect expectations of them. Nowhere in the book of Judge Judges does God say, oh, it appears the Ten Commandments is too difficult for you to keep, so I'm going to alter some of these commandments uh, just so that I can uh, make it easier for you, or I'm going to water down my word so that I don't have to keep punishing you when you break this. I'm going to change this, alter that. No, God says, I'm going to deliver you, but I expect you to do what I commanded you to do because one of the things we learn about God's laws when we read 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 is that God's commandments are not grievous. God's commandments are not burdensome. That means that anything God gives us to obey, that means he has already given us the capacity within our free moral agency to do everything he says. So whenever someone says, well, I can't do that, then that person, by definition, has called God a liar. But see, God expects his people to do what he says. He holds us accountable. He held the people in the book of Judges accountable. He still holds us accountable to this day. So where do you stand this evening? When it comes to salvation, as we talked this morning, salvation is simple. We learn in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. You've heard 
how Jesus is our deliverer judge. You've heard that we're going to be judged by his words. You've heard how Jesus have died on the cross for our sins that we may have a right to eternal life. You've heard about the father, how he is just, how he is merciful, how he is patient, and how he has given you this moment and this opportunity to respond to him this very moment. Do you have faith? Do you believe that God is who he says he is? According to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, for the Bible teaches us, for without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. God has given us this moment to turn away from sin and to turn towards him. For the Bible teaches us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any of us should perish, but that we all should come to repentance. We must confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of the living God, because the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, Verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Why? For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And we must complete our act of obedience by, be buried, by being buried in that watery grave of baptism where we meet the blood of Jesus Christ. For in absence of that, we cannot be saved. This is what the Apostle Peter teaches us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And the like figure doth baptism also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of of Jesus Christ and so if you have yet to obey the gospel this is your opportunity to obey the gospel so God can forgive you of your sins according to Acts 2 38 so he can make you a new creature in Christ Jesus according to 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 so that he can add you to his church according to Acts chapter 2 verse 47 now maybe you are a Christian on tonight maybe you're already a member of the church but you find yourself repeating the same pattern over and over and over again, just like the people of Israel during the period of the judges. Well, this is your opportunity to say enough is enough. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Tonight is the night that I'm going to break this vicious cycle. And when God delivers me this time, I'm going to do the best I can to stay faithful and not turn back to idolatry, not turn back to immorality, and never depart from God from this day forward. And so this is your opportunity to come forward and make things right with your heavenly father before his eternal